Hello. Welcome to episode 42 in our Navigating Turbulent Times webinar series. I'm Jenny Thomas, Head of Marketing Communications at IWFM. For this week's webinar, we've again teamed up with our friends at Make UK, champions of UK engineering and manufacturing, to bring you the third and final in our trio of spring briefings on key changes to the business and legal operating environment happening in 2021. The change, or series of changes, we're focused on today come under the general wrapper of an employment law update, um, collective redundancies, race discrimination, post-termination agreements, gender pay gap reporting. These are the bread and butter of the busy employment lawyer. And what about furlough, the vaccinated workforce, flexible and homeworking? Thankfully, most of us don't have to grapple with the case law that shapes our employment experience. Yet it's our everyday workplace experiences policies and how we implement them that can lead to these landmark decisions and their outcomes that directly inform our working environment and set the standards for our workplace culture and behaviour. To help businesses keep on top of a constantly evolving area, the government has aligned employment law changes around two dates in the year, April and October. On the eve of the first commencement date of 2021, the first with the UK outside of the EU, we are very fortunate to have an expert on hand to help us to understand this contextual part of working life. So I'm delighted today to be joined by Ellie Cowan, who's Senior Legal Advisor at Make UK. Ellie is going to walk us through some of the, case, the key case law cases and why they matter and discuss some of the really practical questions, including the latest on furlough, considerations around the COVID vaccine and other matters. She's here to help us to make sense of this wider context and to signpost post us to help in further information. A very, very warm welcome to you, Ellie. Um, now, I'm going to let Ellie crack on because she's got a lot to cover, but, but as usual, we'll take questions at the end. So please, please post them in the chat as we go through any that occur to you. Um, Ellie, thanks so much and over to you. Oh, thanks so much, Jenny. That's a lovely introduction. And um, I'm so pleased to be here today. And thank you for giving us your time. I know um, you're all very busy individuals, so it's lovely to have an hour of your time to try and bring you up to speed with some of the uh, changes that are going on at the moment. The, the structure of this update is going to take the form of a case law update. We're going to go through three cases um, that have happened in the last sort of six months ish. Um, and we'll be making differences to, to your day-to-day -day lives if you're touching on these areas. And then our where are we with section, which is all about changes that we're anticipating and some that we know are, are going to come up in, in the next um, six months. And then finally, there should be some time for questions. So please do put your questions in the chat, as Jenny said, and, and we will try and get to as many of them as possible. So, if my slides work, which I hope they will. Um, yes, here we go. The first case we are going to look at today is um, a Spanish case, actually, that was referred to the European Court of Justice. And it's around the issue of um, collective consultation when you're making redundancies, and, and specifically when you're making batches of redundancies. So for those of you who have been involved in a redundancy process before, you will know that consultation is king or queen, I should say, in a non-gender uh, biased way. Um, once you've decided that what you need to do is cut heads, that's your reason for termination, but tribunals are absolutely obsessed with process and it is vital that you follow the, the correct process when you're making terminations in order to ensure that they're fair in the event that anyone brings an unfair dismissal claim against you. And, and this case was looking specifically at the additional obligations that are on you as an employer if you are making 20 or more people redundant. You might be familiar with the term collective consultation. And that obligation comes from um, a European, the European Collective Redundancies Directive that has become um, enshrined in our law under the Trade Union and Labour Relations um, Act. And that says if you're making 20 or more redundant, you've got to go through this collective consultation process. And that's quite prescriptive, that process. You need to elect representatives for your affected employees. You need to provide them with specific information um, and you need to consult for a minimum period of 30 days, 45 if you're making 100 or more redundant, to ensure that that process is fair, is fair and complete. Um, and the second part of that is dismissing 20 or more employees within a 90 day period 
so it's not 20 or more pe uh, employees full stop it's 20 or more period in 20 or more employees dismissed within a 90 day period and this case looked at how you work out what that 90 day period is when does it start when does it finish um oh, didn't mean to go that way excuse me i seem to go in the wrong way bear with me it's like technical um fault there <laughs> And bear with me, my slides are a little slow sometimes. So why are we worried about um, European law, given that we are now outside of the EU? You'll all be aware that the transition period ended um, at the end of last year. So why is this even an issue for us? Why are we talking about EU case law? Uh, Sheila, I might need some help. I'm slightly stuck on my slides. And the reason that we are still worried about, I'd like to be on slide five, Sheila, if, that was, if that's possible. No, it's probably not slide five, it's probably about seven on your deck. Um, we are still worried about European case law because when the transition period ended at the end of last year, something called the European Union Withdrawal Act kicked in. And that meant that all of the EU law that was currently in force was sort of picked up and transitioned into UK domestic law. So anything that was in force at the end of last year, and this will include this decision here that we're looking at, the Marclean decision, gets included into UK law. And any other cases that start looking at that law need to be interpreted in a way that gives effect to that European directive ultimately. Um, so unless and until we get really fundamental changes from government, so Parliament produces a new law that changes things, or perhaps the Court of Appeal, the really senior courts, the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court change things and say that's not right, we think it should be done this way, we are still absolutely bound by this, um, by this case law. I'm sorry, I am clicking on these, but nothing's happened. Sheila, you might need to take control back from me, please, if you can. Um, and move on. I'm now on the UQ and Marklean facts slide. So bear with us, please, whilst we just sort this minor technical hitch, which is just wonderful about this way of presenting, isn't it? There always seems to be a little challenge. Um, so this case, UQ and Marklean, was a, a Spanish case, and it concerns uh, this individual employee, UQ, who was dismissed. And she was dismissed just after she went on sick leave. Um, and she brought a claim of unfair dismissal in the Spanish courts. And uh, I mean, her dismissal was a bit of a mess, so it, it wasn't fair. It was procedurally wrong. And she said, yes, it's procedurally wrong, procedurally wrong, excuse me. But also, I was dismissed at the same time um, or after I was dismissed, within the 90 day period after I was dismissed, 36 other employees were dismissed as well, ultimately because the company folded. Um, and so therefore, I think that we were all really dismissed by reason of redundancy. It was because of the, the, the um, changes in the, the, the poor performance of the company, which ultimately led to, to, its, to its closing. And so therefore, the real reason for my dismissal was redundancy. More than 20 people were made redundant within 90 days of me being dismissed. And therefore, I should have been collectively consulted. And the reason this is important is because if there is a failure to collectively consult, a specific award of compensation is made called a protective award, and that's 90 days gross pay for each affected employee. So it's, it's actually a punitive award, which is quite rare in the employment tribunals. Usually um, comp awards of compensation are all about putting the wronged party back into the position they would have been in had they not been wronged. The protective award is a punitive award, and it's, um, and it's, and it punishes people for not going through this collective redundancy process. So it's so you want to avoid that because it's 90 days gross pay for each affected employee. And given you must be talking about 20 or more employees, you can see how that can quite um, quickly add up. So the Spanish Labour Court said we have a problem here because previously our Supreme Court has said that that 90 days is the 90 days immediately before the um, dismissal in question. So in this case, this, this is 90 days before UQ's dismissal. And we're not sure that's right. So we're gonna ask the European Court of Justice for a decision on that. Um, I'm sorry, my slides are really behind now. Um, Sheila, is there any way you can take back control 
and move my slides on for me, please. Would that be possible? Because I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it. Um, and the, so the European Court of Justice looked at this case and they said, um, they said, going back to the collective redundancies directive, so that's the original um, decision of the, that's the original piece of law that implemented this. This was all about protecting employees in this situation, in this group redundancy situation. And therefore, um, and therefore we need to give effect to that. And the only way you can give effect to that is by interpreting this 90 day period really broadly. So we don't think it should be the immediate period before or the immediate period after. We think it should be any rolling day period of 90 days within which that contested dismissal happens. So in UQ's case, that could be day one, her dismissal could be day one, it could be day 89, it could be day 45, it could be anything in the middle, that that's the, um, that that's the way to give effect to the protective, um, the protective ideals behind that directive so that's what that's how we should be interpreting that the challenge with these cases i'm sorry sheila i don't still don't have control of the mouse i can't move i can't move the slides on um sorry everybody sorry alan ellie just to come on we're trying to fix we've got a technical hitch and we're trying to fix it around the back i'm so sorry everybody and ellie for this but um we're, we're just trying to sort out to give you your slides back please bear with us Oh, don't worry, don't worry. I was telling um, Jenny immediately before this, I went on a course about presenting online last week, which was really interesting. And one of the things it said is that things are going to go wrong and you've just got to embrace it um, and deal with it. So um, not to worry, we'll get that going as soon as we can. So what the Marklean case wasn't great at is giving us practical advice on what do we do if we're making a batch of redundancies. This is where this issue really comes in, because if you if you know you're making 25 redundancies right from the start, that's fine, isn't it? You factor in, you're going to be collectively consulting, you, you manage that from the beginning. But what if you are making batches of redundancies? So you start with one lot of redundancies and then you realise after that, oh, we do need to make some more redundancies and those that group of, of um, employees together is going to equal 20 or more. That's the challenge. What we have um, available to you if you're in this situation, which I mean, it's such a valuable tool, is, is something that we've put together called the Redundancy Toolkit. And that contains a huge amount of guidance and documentation to really walk you through this process. And one of the things that's in there is a tool uh, called Which Batches Count? And it, it walks you through lots of different scenarios for different, um, when you're making different batches of redundancies and how you should be treating each of them. And just as an example, because there are, there are a lot of different potential um, situations, if you're making 10 people redundant, for example, you're pretty confident that's all it is. You're starting individual consultation with them. You're not starting collective. So you're speaking to them. You're telling them why you're considering redundancies. You're talking them through any polling. You're talking them through the selection criteria. Perhaps you've got quite far down that line and their dismissals are imminent. Then you realize, actually, we need to make another batch redundant. We need to make 12 more people redundant. And if you combine those numbers, you're obviously at 22. So you're over the threshold for collective consultation. And those dismissals are all going to occur within a 90 day period. What do you do in that situation? Uh, it's, it's tricky. If you want to be absolutely correct, you would probably stop everything, go back, start collective consultation with your first lot as well. You may take a view on that on the basis that when those when those redundancies, the first batch of redundancies were being considered, you genuinely weren't considering making uh, 20 or more redundant. You're very far through, it's almost a fait accompli. What we're gonna do is perhaps go through the process with them, take a small risk perhaps that there, there might be an issue with a protective award, but we'd hope there wouldn't be. But we would suggest you collectively consult in relation to the second lot and, and uh, are more cautious with them. I think in terms of lessons we can know from Marklean, this has always been a grey area. This has sort of helped confirm it's still a little bit of a, a, a tricky area for you to manage. You do need to be careful. If you think you're going to get anywhere near that 20, you do need to be cautious. It does involve some planning. But the key bit from your perspective as a business is to work out what you want that department or perhaps your company to look like at the end of the process. 
and work backwards from that. So how do you want things to look at the end of that process and then work backwards? And if there is a risk, if you know you're going to be at 20 plus or there's a risk that you will collectively consult, there's a huge fear about it, but it really is not rocket science. It, it does take planning. Um, it does take some organisation. It does take some time. Obviously, you've got that minimum 30 day period of consultation once you've elected representatives. But it is absolutely doable. If you really don't know where to start with it, if you're really lost, our redundancy toolkit is honestly is, is brilliant and will really give you a clear way through and, and path ahead. Now, I have a polling question. What do we think, Sheila? Is, are, are we going to be able to run our polls? Or is our technical issue going to thwart us? Oh, excellent. Look, there we go. Beautiful poll. So this relates to our next case. How often do you provide equality and diversity training to your staff or do you how often do you receive it yourself? And then the options we've got there are we don't provide this regularly. We do it at least every five years, at least every two years or at least annually. We'd love it if you could put your answers in. It's all anonymous, so please don't worry. We won't name and shame, I promise. just let that run. Sheila, when it looks like um, we've got most of the answers, would you mind closing that, please? And hopefully we can see some results. OK, I'm going to write those down because that's really interesting. So we don't is 23%, five years is three, two years is 19, at least annually. Well, do you know what? You guys are absolute winners because when we ran this poll for our membership two weeks ago, our highest percentage at 61% was the first one that said we don't provide this regularly. So you guys are doing brilliantly. Well done. Um, this case hopefully we'll, we'll get some slides up in a second but in the meantime i'll just talk you through the, these cases this next case this is a case called um Ale and gellen and it was a case about race discrimination and oh look at that thank you sheila um and specifically it was a case around when you know discrimination has happened as an employer you are vicariously liable for the acts of your employees. So if your employees have discriminated against another employee, you are vicariously liable and, and workers. So it's a bit broader, it's agency staff as well. Um, what are the situations, and there is a potential defense to this where the employer can say, right, we know this happened, but we don't think we should be vicariously liable for these actions because we did everything we could reasonably be expected to do to stop it happening in the first place. And this case looked at um, what uh, what test needs to be met in order for that defence to succeed. So I'm going to Chris Whitty you start now, um, Sheila, and say, can I have my next slide, please? The facts of this case, thank you, are that Mr. Gellan, who called himself, he said, I'm of Indian origin. That's how he described his background. He was employed by LA from a really short time, actually, October 16 to February 2017. And after he'd left, this case wasn't about his termination, but after he'd left, he said, I was subjected to harassment, racial harassment whilst I worked there um, by another employee, Mr. Pearson. And he said, Mr. Pearson made all sorts of comments to me, really unpleasant. He said that I should go work, go and work in a corner shop because of his background. He said that he commented on my brown skin. He asked me why I drive a Mercedes like all other Indians do and asked why I was in the country. Now, LA carried out an investigation after Mr. Gallen had left. And it was found that Mr. Pearson had made these comments, but he characterized them as racial banter. And that's why I hate the word banter, just because it's such an excuse sometimes for awful behavior. And this was one of those this was one of those times. He said, sorry, Gov, racial banter, didn't realise it was offensive. And Ali said, please don't do that again and go on some equality and diversity training. So we then, next slide please, Sheila, we then get to the employment in tribunal. And the employment tribunal find this discrimination did occur. And Ali say, yeah, it, it occurred, but we shouldn't be liable for it. We have got 
policies. We've got an equal opportunity policy, we've got an anti-bullying policy, and Mr Pearson, and importantly all the others involved in this case, because significantly two managers witnessed this behaviour and did nothing to address it. One of the managers, Mr. Gellin actually complained to, and he told, he told Mr. Gellin, or go, you know, go to HR, that kind of lovely fog off, go to, you should speak to HR about that, and he did nothing. And another employee of a peer of Mr. Gellin also witnessed it and didn't do anything. So Anna is saying, we've got these policies, and also Mr. Pearson and all of those other employees who were involved have had quite recent training on this, beginning of 2015, so what, 18, 20 months before Mr. Mr. Um, Gellin starts employment, they all had training on this process um, on um, equality and diversity. So we have done everything we should do. We've got policies, we've given training, we shouldn't be liable for Mr. Pearson's actions. And the Employment Tribunal said, no, we're not buying it. They said, it's really clear that that training you gave is stale. You should know that. It was a, it was a while ago, when they looked at it, it was quite light, it wasn't particularly in depth, wasn't particularly detailed. You should have known it was stale because people aren't doing what they should do in accordance with that training. And another reasonable step open to you would have been to refresh that training. So no, we say your, your defence fails. Alle, they were only ordered to pay, it was less than £6,000 they had to pay in compensation, but they wouldn't let it go. Like a dog with a bone, they appealed to the Employment Appeals Tribunal, which is on the next slide. Um, and the EAT looked at this and said, right, okay, what do you need to do? What do we need to work out when we're working out whether this defence is going to be successful? We need to look at what you have done. We need to look at your policies. We need to look at the training you've delivered um, in detail. So we will look at the detail of your policy and we will look at the detail of the training delivered. And then we'll look at what else could you have done? Are there any other reasonable steps you could have taken? And we agree with the tribunal that refresher training would have been a reasonable step in this situation. When you're working out what's reasonable, you're looking at things like cost, practicability, also likelihood of effectiveness. So if something definitely wouldn't have worked, it's not going to be a reasonable step to have taken. But equally, it doesn't have to have definitely worked, definitely prevented the harassment for it to be a reasonable step. But they agreed with the tribunal with the tribunal here, and they made a really important point about the quality of training. They said brief and superficial training is unlikely to have a substantial effect in preventing harassment. Forcefully presented training is more likely to be effective and to last longer. It gives you an idea of the level of detail that tribunals will look at. Um, so they agreed, the defence failed, they were liable for Mr Pearson's actions. So on the next slide we've got lessons we can take from this. This defence is tough to run. Um, you're not going to be running it unless you're really confident that, well, you might give a go, but you, you're unlikely, you know you're unlikely to succeed unless you've got a lot of process behind you. Having a, a policies isn't enough. You have got to make sure your policies are up to date, that they're fit for purpose. More important than anything, that they are acted upon. If you get incidents like this happening, that people are proactive, you're not relying on the victim to make a complaint. In this case, these managers definitely should have addressed Mr. Pearson's behaviour, and they didn't. Um, and if you run training, I know it's so tempting to just order that sort of 15 minute, you know, watch this video and then answer three questions and you get your certificate at the end of it. It's not going to get you very far at the end of the day if you are faced with a claim. So forcefully presented training of a type I'm very happy to deliver, you'll be pleased to hear, um, is much more effective than sort of on online tick box exercises. Right, I think we've got another polling question. This one is around restrictions in um, restrictions in contracts. Have we got the have we got the meat of it, Sheila, to put up? Ah, lovely. Thank you. So, do you have post termination restrictions in your employment contracts? Do you have them for people just at a certain level? For all employees, do you not have them or do you not know? We'd love to see your answers. Right, Sheila, if we've got most answers in, perhaps we can close that and get the answers up. Okay. 
So 37% say yes for every uh, for senior employees, 10 for all, that's good. Uh, no, 13, and oh, I have no idea what you're talking about, it's 40%, 40%, which is totally fair. Um, so this case was looking at post-determination restrictions. And this is a thorny, thank you, this is a thorny issue because it's, it's really complex. It's a complex area of law. And I think this case demonstrates why that is very well. What we're looking at here are three different clauses. We're looking at non-compete clause, which says you can't go to a competitor after you've worked for us for, for a set period of time. We're looking at non-solicitation and non-dealing clauses, which are all around, please don't talk to um, any of our clients or customers after you go. And these are okay, but they're okay and they're enforceable as long as you can show that you are trying to protect a legitimate business interest, that you've got something you want to protect with these clauses, and that these clauses don't go too far in their attempts to protect them. So they've got to be reasonable as to time, as to geography, as to you know, details of the clients that are covered, for example. So the facts of Quilter on the next slide are all around um, a financial advisor, but, but the same principles apply whatever industry you're in. Emma Faulkner began working as a financial advisor for Quilter, and she took over a book of clients from another financial advisor who was retiring. It didn't go well, and six months in, she's still in her probationary period, and she decides to resign so she can move to Continuum. Um, who provide very similar financial services as Quilter do. Um, she only had to give two weeks notice because she's in a probationary period and she was placed on garden leave for that time. Now her contract was detailed and it contained a few key clauses. One was a full-time and attention clause. So while she's working, while she's employed by Quilter, she has to devote her full-time and attention to them. She can't go and do anything for anyone else. And it also had post-termination restrictions. So after you leave, you can't work with anyone who competes with us for, I think it was nine months, and you can't deal or solicit any of our clients for 12 months after termination. Okay, those were the clauses. Forgive me looking at my notes there. Um, Quilter knew that she was going to work for Continuum. Continuum wrote and said, can we have a reference? Quilter said, yes, here it is. They didn't at that point say, oh, by the way, she's subject to the restrictions and you need to abide by them too. Otherwise you could be guilty of facilitating that breach of contract. Um, and they waited, so they knew she was there, but they waited four and a half months, at which point they realized she'd pinched some confidential information and was contacting their clients. And then they brought an injunction in the high court to enforce those restrictions, an interim ju judgment pending the, um, the final hearing. By the time it got to the final hearing, all of the restrictions had lapsed due to time um, and the value of the case was £39,000. So they were really arguing about the half a million pound legal costs that, um, well, mainly Quilter had built up. So the High Court found at the final hearing that the Continuum weren't guilty of facilitating any breach of contract of Emma's contract. They found that they hadn't been on notice that there was this whole time and attention clause. So when she'd attended an induction course while still employed by Quilter, they didn't know that that meant she was breaching her contract. They didn't know that she was prohibited from taking client information so that when she took it and then uploaded it onto their portal, that that was a breach. So they weren't liable for inducing her breach. She did, however, breach her contract in a number of ways. It's quite critical of her, the judgment. She, she pinched a whole load of information. She attended um, this course when she shouldn't have been because she was still employed by Quilter um, and she was contacting um, clients afterwards. So what the High Court looked at yet yeah, next was, OK, so there are these restrictions, but are they enforceable? And what they found is they weren't because they were too broad. They weren't tailored specifically for her situation. They were too broad and so they weren't enforceable and therefore their claim failed and they would then be liable for their half a million pound legal costs that they'd racked up. So if we look at those individually, the next slide is about the non-compete clause. This prevented her from competing with Quilter as a business for nine months term, uh, post termination for anything that she'd done for Quilter. She couldn't do for anyone else nine months per termination. And the High Court had a number of issues with this. They said, 
they said, fine, there's a legitimate business interest you're trying to protect their quilter, which is, you know, your customers, your confidential information. But this is too much. It's too broad. She's only got a two weeks notice period. So how is nine months reasonable period to restrict her for? Um, they also, and this shows how detailed they'll grow into, they looked at her boss's contract and they looked at her boss's boss's contract. And her boss had the same restrictions as she did, despite the fact he had access to more confidential information. Her boss's boss had shorter restrictions than she did, and he's got access to much more confidential information. So how does that work? Nothing, nothing is tailored. It's a really a one size fits all, which doesn't work. You say that it doesn't affect her from dealing with um, areas of the country where Quilter doesn't cover, but Quilter covers everywhere. So that, so that carve out, which is called, doesn't have any impact. And also she lives in Exeter, her clients are in Exeter. Why on earth shouldn't she be touting for business in Carlisle if she so wants? There's no confidential issue there. So the non-compete clause was just too wide, as were on the next slides, the non-solicitation and non-dealing clauses, which stopped her from contacting clients. That stopped her from contacting her for 12 months post termination. Anyone who'd been a client and she had had any sort of contact with for 18 months pre termination. So that covered a whole load of time for which she wasn't even employed. Um, and it was just it was just too much. It was just too broad. It covered people who long since stopped being clients of Quilter. It covered anyone that she made a call to. It covered anyone that was on that book of clients, even if she hadn't dealt with them. So it. it it was just all too much. It went much further than they needed to to protect the legitimate business interests, which they did. They, they excuse me, they did have. Um, and it's just a lesson. If we look at the lessons we can learn from that, it's just a lesson on if what you want is a bit of a deterrent. If if you just want something in contracts which discourages people from pinching your customers, taking a load of your staff after they go then fine, you can have a really generally drafted clause that you whack in there. But if what you want is something that's punchy and enforceable, it needs to be drafted very carefully. We Before we can draft that for you, we need to understand your business. We need to understand what interest you're trying to protect and how far we can push it so we get you maximum protection without it risking being unenforceable. That was a whistle stop tour through restrictive governance. I hope you're still with me. And there is a consultation on the next slide, actually. The government's just closed on what to do around these. What they're proposing is, is potentially requiring employee employers to pay for any period of restriction or just banning them um, altogether. And we've fed into that at Make UK. So we'll, we'll be publishing, we'll be talking about the results when, the, when they come out. So do keep an eye out for that. Right, the final slide on this case law section uh, is around uh, cases that we should keep an eye on. I'm sure you all heard about Uber and Aslam, which is a massive case for the gig economy. I'm not sure totally how relevant it is for you guys, um, so we won't go into a lot of detail, but what it means is that those drivers are now classed as workers, so they get national minimum wage, paid annual leave, whistleblowing protection, things like that. So it's, it's huge implications for that area of the economy. Cosmo and Dunkley is um, before the uh, Supreme Court, what used to be called the House of Lords. They're deciding that this year. That's about what happens where you, you have a trade union and you're trying to negotiate pay, but you get to the end of the road of that negotiation without reaching an agreement and you really have hit a brick wall. What the case law says at the moment, this case says at the moment, is that in that situation, you can circumvent the tri tri tribunal, excuse me, the trade union, and make a direct offer to your employees. Um, but it's bounced back and forth as it's gone up the uh, gone up the court. So it'll be really interesting to get the Supreme Court's final decision because of course now there's no appeal to the European Court of Justice, so that will be the final decision. Flowers in East England is around holiday pay and whether holiday sh pay should include voluntary regular overtime, and at the moment it should. Um, so again, interesting to get the House of Lords take on that. And Harper and Brazel is around how you work, how you calculate holiday entitlement for someone who only works part of the year. And that is a complex little case. Um, at the moment, it's not prorated down in the way you might expect it to be. So that will be, be interesting to see what the House of Lords, um, sorry, Supreme Court does with that. Right, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to whiz on to my where are we with section. Um, COVID-19, how nice will it be when we can run one of these and not refer to COVID-19? We're certainly not there yet. 
furlough has been extended to the 30th of September. Um, at the moment, the government will pay up to 80% of unworked hours, up to this cap of 2,500 um, per month, and that's prorated down for people who are part-time or on flexi furlough, which I know a lot of people are using. There will be, at the, at the moment, you can choose to top up, top up to 100% if you want, you don't have to. There will be a tapering of support from the government. So starting from July, that's going to go down to them, the government contributing 70% and employers being expected to top up the extra 10 and then further along to 60 and, and employers can topping up to um, 80. Um, and then hopefully come September, we'll be able to wave goodbye to the furlough scheme and, and things will be reopened again. But it, it's all, as always, it's a case of watch this space. Um, we do have a coronavirus hub on our website, which is open to all non-members as well. There is a huge amount of information on there. So if you've got questions around this, um, we've added to it as it's gone. So you'll see it's, it's, there's a significant body of work there. Um, but it's a really good first stop if you've got questions around this um, subject. COVID vaccinations. This is a really hot topic, and I know Boris was speaking about it last week, wasn't he, about would it be responsible for employers to require employees to have the vaccination? And he was saying it would. We are more cautious, as you would expect from a bunch of lawyers, probably. At the moment, you can't force employers, employees to have the vaccination. You absolutely can communicate on it. You can encourage, you can offer information and support to people who have concerns, but you can't force them to have it. It's probably not going to be a reasonable instruction so that if someone refuses, you could dismiss them. Perhaps depending on your workplace, on your individual workplace and maybe care homes, for example, you can start to see an argument, but it's quite a strong thing to do. And we think even if you get your ducks in a row and you say, yes, we think this is a reasonable management instruction to ask people to do this, you are still running quite a few discrimination risks. So people who can't have the vaccine because they have some underlying health condition, um, pregnant people can't have the vaccine currently, um, older people are having it, being offered it regularly, but you know it's taking a while to filter down to younger people. So do you risk an age discrimination claim? And also some, some religions don't believe that vaccines are appropriate. So that there's, there's a bit of a minefield there. We think unlikely that anti-vaccines would, would come within that sort of religion and belief category, but it, you know, it's an evolving field. Um, we love a bit of data protection reference. I think that some of you would have attended this. Um, oh no, it was IR35, sorry, wasn't it, talk on this. If you are processing data about whether someone has had a vaccine or not, um, whether it's willingly offered or not, you are processing special category data and therefore you need to have your ordinary legal basis for processing that data, but you also need to have a, a further additional legal basis because it's special category, it's, it's protected data. It's probably that's going to be an argument that you're, it's necessary to comply with the legal, legal obligation in, reply, in relation to employment law all around health and safety, but you do need to have that thought process documented if you want to be data protection compliant. On the next slide, there's a lot of information about guidance around this. ACAS is a really good place to start if you've got questions. Um, they've got they've put together a really sort of comprehensive guidance around this. So that's where I would start. We've also got some stuff on our website and the ICO will talk you through the data protection issues around this. But other COVID implications, working from home from abroad um, and I've had a query on this this morning this is a very live topic um, last week I was speaking to a company we've got three employees two of whom have been in Poland I think for nearly a year now because they went over at the beginning of lockdown one of whom is saying I'd like to go for six months because I haven't seen my family all year and these are the kind of considerations we think you need to be um, aware of if you're agreeing for your employees to work overseas on, for any sort of prolonged period of time. Um, there's income tax potentially incurring liabilities in this country and that country as well. You can also inadvertently sometimes create a sort of a corporate, corporate tax liability by creating this permanent establishment in the host country. Um, a big point I think is the impact it might have on people's ability to apply for settled status or achieve settled status 
because if they've been out of the country for more than six months, that could be an issue. There are exceptions, but they're quite limited. Um, we do know, helpfully, that from the 1st of February, you can temporarily post an employee to an EU country for two years without incurring most of these liabilities, not the settled status, but sort of the tax liabilities. So that's a really helpful thing to know and a really reassuring, um, reassuring thing to know, um, which is relatively recent. Um, but it is something to really consider if you've got this and it's affecting you. It is something I would suggest getting specialist advice on to understand what the implications are around this. Okay, I think we have our third and final polling question. Thanks, Sheila. This one's around change. Let's little refresh the last one. This next one's around um, changing in working practices, which is something we're talking to our members an awful lot about at the moment. Um, around requests for flexibility and working from home and people who have been working from home enjoying it and asking for it to continue. So what we'd like to know from you is as restrictions are eased, are you or your organisation looking to formalise any changes to working practices? And your options are no, we plan on working towards a, a return to pre-COVID arrangements. Yes, mainly employer driven, sort of flexible hybrid working patterns. Or yes, but you know, when we're asked by employees, then we'll, we'll be thinking about it. So we'd love your answers on that one. Thanks, Julie. Have we got those in now? Okay. Oh, that is really, really interesting, actually. It's interesting you ask different people. So when we've asked this before, 40% um, said that they are not planning on making any changes. Um, and perhaps that reflects our cohort. So I work principally with manufacturers. And obviously, um, Manufacturers, you know, you you can't put together a Henry vacuum cleaner from home. You have to have people on those operate on those lines operating the lines. So perhaps that reflects that more from from your your percentage, twenty eight, saying you're going to return to a pre COVID working arrangement. And we are seeing quite a lot of that from people saying we just don't think we're going to need the office space that we required before. We're going to have a much more flexible working arrangement and from a, an employee point of view you can see it can't you it's quite a powerful argument to say i've been doing this for the last year and i've and i've done it really well um you haven't raised any issues with me so why is it that i can't continue to do that going forwards um so it will be interesting whenever we get out of this to see what that that sort of the new normal looks like okay i r35 um, I think I'm hoping most of you attended our talk on this, so I don't plan on going on a huge level of detail. But for those who perhaps didn't or just need a, a refresher, um, IR35 was supposed to come in. Um, the change was supposed to happen last year, but it was delayed because of COVID by a year. This is around companies that use a personal service contractor company. So you might just call them contractors. So you don't pay them directly you pay their companies and previously you would just pay their companies and the liability for tax would then be on them to account for it and what hmrc realized is that there were quite a few people um and there were quite a lot of people using this as a way of getting a preferential tax treatment i mean i i know of companies who've used sort of operators on on lines but they've been employed by a personal service companies which is a really sort of it doesn't it doesn't quite sit right does it so hmrc said right we see this we see what's going on and rather than having to go and chase individuals for money which tends to be not particularly productive we think we're going to just ask the companies to work it out and then if you get it wrong we can ask you for the money and you're much more likely to pay us than joe blogs with his little personal service company is so that's the change it's about liability for tax there's actually no change to the meat of ir35 which has always said if you remove that personal service company and without that that person looks very much like an employee 
they should be treated like an employee and they should be taxed like an employee. Now, working out whether they are an employee or not has never been straightforward and it's still not. There is a tool, HMRC have a CEST tool, C-E-S-T tool, which, which takes you through the process and gives you an indication, but it's not definitive. The kind of things we would be thinking about and CEST thinks about is, what about, what about if, if that person sends someone else in their place? Is that, is that allowable? Do you just want that service to be provided and you don't care who provides it as long as it's done to your standards? Or do you really want that particular individual to come like you do in an employment relationship? Um, how much control do you have over that person? Do you tell them at the beginning of the month, right, I want you to do X, Y and Z and then leave them to get on with it? Or are you really monitoring them? Do you know what they're doing um, a lot of the time? Mutuality of obligation is all around the expectation of both of the parties. So would it be possible for you to turn around to that individual and say, actually, we don't need you for the rest of the week or the month, or we don't need you ever again. And, and that would be okay with that individual. Um, that would be sort of within what they're expecting, the possibilities of what they're expecting, or would they be utterly shocked and think, oh my goodness, I thought I was gonna get work from you for the foreseeable future equally, what would your approach be if they said I'm not working for you anymore would that be a big issue or would that be fine that's the terms we agreed um that suggests that there isn't a mutuality of obligation a uh, degree of integration to the business do they have an email do they have a laptop do they get invited to Christmas parties when you're allowed to have Christmas parties and um, all of those things the more integrated they are the more they're looking like an employee um but no one issue is is definitive no one issue answers the questions is why what makes it a really challenging um question to answer what you do what you must do with all contractors that you're using in this way all personal service companies is go through a status determination for them and you must provide them with a status termination statement and ideally you will do that before tomorrow because this is when oh sorry no before the sixth not the first because this is when it all starts, which doesn't leave very long, does it, with the bank holiday weekend. Um, if you are, this is throwing you into a huge panic and you would like help with that, please do get in contact. We've got experts on hand who can walk you through that process or just provide you with some general guidance, whatever it is that you need. Um, because there is, um, on the next slide, we talk about the, what the implications uh, for you are, and, and there is an increased administrative burden and cost and risk if you get it wrong. So you do need to go through this audit, carry out a risk analysis of arrangements and calculate the potential additional cost. The cost usually isn't huge for you, but, the, but there will be um, some implications that you do need to, to factor in. My gender pay gap reporting. Um, if you have more than 250 employees in your organization and it is per organization so it's not about group companies it's individual entities if you have more than 250 employees you need to be reporting on your gender pay gap um, and the next deadline is the 4th of april everyone was given a, a, a buy last year because again coronavirus obviously so you didn't have to report last year but you do need to report this year um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission have very helpfully said we're not going to enforce, make and take any enforcement action on this until October. So you've sort of, you have got a bit of a leeway, but if you can get on with it, your data is likely to be quite skewed because of COVID. It's some really, really helpful guidance from the government. The link's there on the slide, and hopefully when we send the slides through, that should be accessible to you. Because they have said things like you, um, you don't need to report if people have been furloughed. So when you're looking at mean and median um, pay, you can exclude those people who've been furloughed, which I know is going to be really, really helpful to a lot of companies. You do need to include them for things like bonuses. So it's not totally straightforward. You can't ignore them entirely, um, but you can, you can exclude them for some of those reporting criteria, which I think is going to be really useful. GDPR. It's almost illegal for us to do any employment law update without referencing data protection. We have to do it. Um, we now know, don't we, that this GDPR has become incorporated into our domestic law through the UK GDPR and also the Data Protection Act, and it's broadly the same. Um, and there's a reason for that, which is we want to be able to share information with the EU, so we want them to be happy with our data protection standards. And at the moment, we can freely 
um, send information to and from the EU. That ends in the same way as other um, rules change come July. But we are very hopeful that we will get a, an adequacy decision before then from the EU, which looks at our regime and says, yep, yeah, you're doing everything we want you to, so there can be a free flow of information between us. We also need to do the same in reverse, and again, that, that, that is very likely to happen. So hopefully that will be um, smooth sailing, but you do need to be cautious if you're um, sending data to the EU or any other countries outside of the EU, also particularly if you're processing data that it belongs to EU, um, EU citizens. So do be aware. Um, again, I promise not to do too many plugs, but if you literally don't know what you're, where to start with data protection, we have a suite of documents that you can purchase, which will get you set up really, really well if you're thinking we're behind on this and we, we need to catch up. That's a great place to start. Um, the other issue, Brexit, which won't go away, the right to work. Um, you, If you have EU workers, you will probably hopefully be aware that they have or are in the process of applying for settled status or pre-settled status if they haven't been in for five years before the end of the year. Um, you can't demand to see evidence of that yet. You, you, can, you can do a check um, on the internet, actually, um, online check uh, from July. But as things stand at the moment, there's a sort of odd ruling where you can't demand to see evidence of, of people's settled status. But what you absolutely can do, as we talked about earlier, is open up that dialogue with your employees, is offer support, um, offer support with it if that's what they need. You can signpost them information. And if they volunteer or, or if you ask and they say, yes, I've got it, do you want to see it? You can absolutely take that evidence of the settled status. But having, as long as you've seen their EU passports when you first brought them on as employees, that will be evidence of their right to work. Um, you, you won't fall foul of those rules um, on that. But from July, you will need to check settled status and you can do that online. There'll be more information coming out about that. Uh, nearer the time. And then finally, um, we've got some statutory rate changes, which is generally talk about April and October. We like to have a few changes that go on, and we've got some rate changes there to maternity, paternity adoption, pay, statutory sick pay, maximum compensation reward if, if you happen to be on the wrong side of an employment tribunal. Um, and capital weeks pay for things like uh, redundancy pay that's going up to 544 and then the next slide we just talk about um, the, the language around this is so confusing it talks about national living wage but don't get confused between that and the um, voluntary living wage the national living wage is the minimum wage but for people who are 23 and over it's a really unhelpful change I think in terminology um, and that sets out the rates that people can apply, will apply. The only thing to note there is the apprentice rate. You'll see the increase in that of 3.6% is more generous um, than the others. And that's because they want to bring the apprentice rate up to the minimum wage for 16 and 17 year olds. And I think that is almost the end of my slides. How we can help? We've got, if we click onto the next slide, Sheila, thank you. There's my um, fruit and veg delivery just coming up. <laughs> keeping it real for you. Um, IR35, there's loads and loads of help that we can offer on this, um, lots of template documents. Um, if you need specific help, please do get in contact. We are an membership organisation, but we do provide lots of help to other um, organisations as well. Um, we've also got, I think on the next slide, um, post-Brexit and COVID-19, we've got a couple of hubs to so do have a look at our website for that if you think there's anything that could help you or your business. Um, and is that oh GDPR? Yes, as I say, obligatory. We mention this in every in everything we talk about, and we do have a load of template, and it is very very good. That, that pack of template documents is excellent. If that's something you think would um, help your business, I can thoroughly recommend it. It's definitely worth the investment. I think it's about six hundred pounds. Um, and there we are. Some webinars web, webinar coming up. Um, Bespoke issues with subject access requests. If you have one of those horrible things come in and you are just absolutely overwhelmed by information, then um, that's something that we can um, that we can help you with. Uh, and I think that's it from me.
oh no a quality university we do offer that if you want to get up to speed having listened to that case of Ale, please do give a shout i love deliver delivering equality and diversity training it's literally one of my favorite things to do i'm not sure what that says about me but um if you want one of us to come in and talk to you about it then please do give us a shout jenny oh thank you so much ellie for that unbelievably comprehensive rattle through um what's going on on the employment law scene and and brilliantly brilliantly improvised uh, when we weren't able to provide you with um your own slides um to go through the first thing on collective redundancy so sorry to you and everybody about that but we have got the slides um for anybody who wants to have a look again at what you've gone through um on the website but but um we like keeping it real here on the turbulent yeah. times platform um now we haven't i think you've been so comprehensive actually that we haven't had tons of questions but um jonathan cummings has just um posted one in the chat now and he says i know we covered it but can you confirm that employers cannot dismiss you if you if you have not or will not have the vaccination thank you yeah, it's, it's really unlikely to be a fair dismissal, assuming you have two years service. So if you've got more than two years service, the burden is always on the employer to show there's a fair reason for dismissal. And those potentially fair reasons are redundancy, conduct, um, capability. So this would probably fall into a conduct case because it's about behaviour. And it's really unlikely to be a fair dismissal um, at the moment to have required you to have gone, gone had a vaccine and you've refused. If you've got less than two years service, your protection is a lot less. So if you're a new employer, employee, sorry, um, unless you can say the reason I haven't had it is perhaps for some underlying health reason, so you've got a disability, or because of your religion, and in which case you would then have a discrimination claim. But if none, if you don't fit into any of those categories, actually your protection is quite limited until you've got two years service. Thanks very much, Ali. That's that's um, that's clear, but it's clearly a developing area, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, because Boris trying to Boris is really clearly trying to encourage this, but actually he's going to have to. There's going to have to be specific legislation, I think, to um, to allow employers to be really forceful, because otherwise you're doing so with quite a high risk. So I think it definitely is a case of watch watch this space. What, what do you think will happen would happen or will anything change at the point of recruitment we've we've heard talk about a sort of no jab no job policy what what how do you think things might develop on that front that's a more interesting question isn't it because then you're you're setting out your stall at the beginning of the employment so you're saying we'd love you to work for us but this is these are the deal this is the deal and one of the deals is you have to have had a vaccination um you're still going to be running discrimination risks there if someone says I haven't had it because of my religion, because of my age, because I'm pregnant, because I've got an underlying health condition, um, something that fits into one of those protected characteristics, you're, you're going to be running risks there. But actually, if you're, you know, a healthy 45 year old who doesn't have any underlying health conditions, you're not pregnant, you, you know, you've been offered the vaccine and you've just chosen not to do it because you don't want to for whatever reason. Actually, it is open to me as an employer to say I don't want to employ you. That's that. That's um, yeah. The no jab, no job rule is is a possibility there. Um, but I think it's I think it's quite a brave employer who has a sort of a blanket policy on that. And I think that's that's a relatively risky one to run. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder whether that will. We're, we're hearing this as the discussion be around specific sectors, aren't we? I know there's been lots of conversation around, for example, the care home sector and areas like that, perhaps where you can see you know, the trade-offs that might need to be made. Um, yeah, and there's a balance there, isn't there, between employee rights and, you know, the, what your rights are as an employer and what your rights are as a service user. So if I'm putting my mother in a care home, really what I want is for everyone to be vaccinated. And will I then choose not to go to that care home because I know your vaccination rates are low? Am I going to know that? How am I going to know that information? And actually the vaccine rates in some care homes are low, aren't they? It's quite interesting, that sector. Um, it's a very, very much an evolving picture. Yeah, so perhaps if we have you back next year, there might be some interesting case law that you <laughs> would be able to talk to us well, about that. With the backlog at the moment in the Employment Tribunal, I'm not too sure. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> but maybe in two years' time. 
maybe it'll take a while. I've got another one for you, Ellie, which is um, you, you talked a, a bit about you know flexible working. We did the we did the poll, which I think was 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 quite interesting to see how people on the on the webinar um, you know were, were having that experience. And of course, there's, there's sort of lots of wider polling going on, um, including by ourselves on that. But um, this is an area of huge interest. What work's going to look like? But do, do you think? Can you foresee the rules changing on flexible working? What's your sense of where you think that might go? There's definitely potential for it. BAYIS or BIS, what I used to call BIS and now has a very unsatisfactory acronym, but um, they're, they're consulting on it at the moment actually and talking about changes. And one of the things they're thinking about is introducing it as a day one right. So you'll remember a few years ago, anyone has since for a few years anyone's been able to request flexible working it hasn't you haven't had to show that you've got a dependent or a child under five or 18 or whatever the rules used to be um but you have to have 26 26 weeks service as an employee so one of the changes they're thinking about is making that a day one right um and it's really interesting from my perspective because i work principally with manufacturers and, and there are there's a quite a, a core old school contingent who really just want everyone back in and want to be able to see everyone and eyeball and I want to see you sitting at your desk until 5.30 every day and I'm really not confident you're doing your job if I can't see that. But then also a lot of employers who are saying actually this works brilliantly for us, everyone's worked well, they like the flexibility, they like the fact they can go for a walk at lunchtime, they can pick up the kids after school um, and we can reduce our office space so we can save money. So it's, I think you, you, you're you never going to get complete flexibility, but will be very interesting to see how it develops once restrictions are properly lifted. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely one to watch. And I think that's, you know, particularly for for for, for our area and our work, you know, workplace and the future of that. I think it's it's really fascinating how that's going to unfold. And I think lots and lots of people, including our audience today, will be really watching that with interest over the, over the coming months. And um, I, I think I'm going to wrap it up there for questions because we're at one o'clock and I know that people who've given up their lunchtime for this might want to go and have a cuppa or do whatever it is they need to do before they get back to um, the day job. Um, but it's been absolutely fascinating um, having you um, talk us through that, Ellie. I, I, I just got a couple of, of little notices to go through, um, including our general insight hub, which has got all of our research area um, information posted on it including technology including um, stuff around um, workplace and workplace strategy um, so and sustainability of course as well so do have a look at that um, we've also got our own COVID I was smiling to myself when you were talking about your home COVID hubs thinking we've got the battle of the COVID hubs on our webinar today um, and you know I'm sure that there's lots and lots of information complementary um, between our two um, COVID hubs so um, you know our our audience absolutely know where to go for anything else and then just a very very final plug from me we launched our annual conference yesterday um we're going for it we're doing a hybrid event so we're having in the room 13th of september we've got an amazing agenda for that um with Deborah francis white um aka the guilty feminist Headlining, and she's being bookended by David Olusoga, historian, writer, um, and all-round um, expert, and also somebody who's in the he's in the top ten of the Black Britain power list. So we've got a really amazing agenda for that. If you don't fancy um, getting into the city, you're not quite ready for that. Then there's an online version of that as well, a digital ticket available. So have a look at our website for our exciting conference. Um, and finally, um, thank you again so, so much, Ellie, and to all of the Make UK team for these three webinars that we've done together. They've been really super informative. There's tons of follow-up places to go um we've got the slides um for everybody who wants to um follow those up um we'll be back next week same time same place when we've got something again completely different because we'll be taking you through the results of our outlook survey which we ran earlier in the spring and had a bumper record number of um responses to so we've got some really great insights to share on that so do join us next week Thank you to Ellie. Thank you so much for our tech team. I'm sorry we had some sticky keys and we couldn't quite get through the slides. Um, but Sheila and the team um, were behind the scenes um, helping to deliver our webinar today. So thank you for them. Um, for all of, from all of us at IDWF, um, have a great week and happy Easter um, and enjoy hopefully the sunshine while it lasts. Um, and we'll see you all soon. Bye bye.